Well, when we talk about emerging technology, we can't leave out nanotechnology. That sounds like a big, long word. Let's find out what it is. I'm Warren Whitlock, and this is the Emerging Technology Explain podcast. And let's start off by defining what is nanotechnology. That's pretty simple. It's the scale of nanometers. A nanometer is one, one billionth of a meter. Yeah, it's small. It's really small. And what's happened is science is finding things like physics that works completely different, so many more things than we thought was possible, and basically a chance for us to exponentially change the world. And when we combine this with what's going on in blockchain, AI, and other offshoots of these things, It just gets really interesting, really fast, and loads of opportunities for you. And that's why we're talking about it. Let's start off where nanotechnology came from. Back in 1959, very long ago, happened to be on a very early birthday of mine. I'm embarrassed to say which, because it means I am that old. But yes, it was my fourth birthday, 1959. And had nothing to do with me. I wasn't there. I wasn't quite into nanotechnology at that point. And a man by the name of Richard Feynman, you may have heard of him, Feynman, F-E-Y-N-M-A-N. He did a talk called, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, and was talking about using very small things to build new and exciting different things. At the time, we didn't know near as much about what nanotechnology is. In fact, he didn't use the word nanotechnology. It was, and I believe it's the piece I saw is a couple hours long, talks about a lot of interesting things at that point. Richard Feynman, who would, he, he is in the Oppenheimer movie, small part of it, but he was there in Los Animals and had a lot to do with that work. And then went on to be a Nobel winning scientist. And this is one of the things that he was, that he did quite well. He was known for later. But literally, they left this alone. Some people in the 60s and 70s talked about it. By 1986, another book came out. This is K. Eric Drexler, D-R-E-X-L-E-R. And he wrote a book called Engines of Creation. And he used the term nanotechnology, or more specific, molecular, or atomically precise manufacturing. And he uses the acronym APM, Atomically Precise Manufacturing, which means it's using the top atoms and the size of atoms, precisely, of course, and then then manufacturing things, so from the ground up. And that's why Richard Feynman said from the bottom up, it's the very small. It's starting with the smallest thing that we know, we really know about. There are subatomic particles. We'll leave some ato- subatomic nanotechnology to some to a later date. Because right now, what what Drexler called nanotechnology is what excites me. From that now, that's been 40 years ago, uh, 38, and there's been a lot of other use of the word nanotechnology. And quite often, what's in the news is someone working on something like drug delivery systems, robots in your bloodstream, and that kind of small, which is okay, but it's just part of it. Atomically precise manufacturing really gets into material science and how it recreates the stuff we build everything out of. And I do mean everything. Let's talk about some of the, some of the things that I've seen that are happening now and what we'd like to get into in future episodes of the podcast. But just today's an overview, so let's talk about all of them. Electronics, everything from mic- tr- transistors and chips and tiny hard drives that are no longer drives. It used to be you needed a spinning disk and like a record player or CD to make a disk drive work. Now it's stored in memory and it's getting smaller. The chips are designed now to be only nanometers thick. And it gets down to practically atom size in some of the chips that are being designed today. And of course, they're looking at other things to do because 
when you get down to the size of an atom, you can't shrink anymore. Electronics has been way ahead on this, doing it, but they're still hardly building it from the atoms up. They're actually etching lasers precisely into silicon, making chips that way, etching the lines and everything that need to be in there, making a dye, making more of a manufacturing process that we'd understand. What will happen next is figuring out ways to, uh, there is some biotech looking at this and other things of where you can make something that you grow the transistors. And when we get into that, then of course, the technology starts expanding over time on whatever it is. And we get more and more capability from that. We're not going to give up on the silicon anytime soon, but imagine that the silicon is we're getting double every year of, out of the silicon still for a while more. And meanwhile, we've got other things that are going to come behind that. That'll be even more exciting as to computing capability. In medicine, there's the drug delivery systems, whether or not you can match a molecule that is meant for a particular organ in a particular place and no longer have to be, try for a drug that'll go to one, that'll work on everyone. You work, you get a drug that will work on one person. And so if, for instance, the example is if you have a drug that will cure 90% of the people that take it and kill the other 10%, then you want to make sure you give that drug to the right people. The atomically precise manufacturing means we can make drugs that are exactly what they are. We grow from atoms or assemble from atoms. We get to match exactly what we need. And then, of course, with other technologies from AI and other breakthroughs in medicine, we would be able to pick exactly who we're giving that drug to. The tools we use in diagnosing things making artificial skin, all of this is a matter of growing from very small up instead of traditional manufacturing is more like I think of the lathe where it's a spinning piece of wood or metal and in a jig and it rotates around and then some, I'm not really even sure how a lathe works, the cutter, the diamond tip, whatever, the drill bit kind of thing like cuts into it and you make interesting patterns from that. Pretty precise these days and what they can do with that, but not as precise as starting from atoms and then working up. It's being used in solar cells, batteries, fuel cells, and all sorts of things. There's a, a project where they start producing hydrogen. And traditionally to produce hydrogen, you start off with water and use some kind, you use electricity. I'm staying very general because this is about how much I know on the specifics of some of this chemistry. But traditionally, you would separate hydrogen or oxygen out of water, both good things to have by themselves, but very expensive in scale to do that, and then difficult to move around. As a gas, there you takes a whole lot of it. If you can liquefy it some way, that costs a lot to liquefy it. So those, those fuels have not been used as much as they could but if hydrogen became something that a device could make out of just thin air, imagine the possibilities for electricity. And the big thing is the material products. The opportunity to make something that's so small uh, that does what much better than what a larger item can do. And I think of carbon nanotubes here. You probably heard the term carbon nanotubes. What it, it's a tube, but whether or not it appears in a tube has to do with the physics of the thing. Basically, we're talking about carbon fibers that start off at one atom thick. So think of a thread that is a piece of thread that is one atom thick, very small. I like when they describe how they make graphite, graphene. They make graphene but the same way you would make something interesting when you're bored in grammar school. You take a pencil, you scribble a bunch of, or cover a, a, an area on a piece of paper, and you take a piece of scotch tape and you attach to it and you pull it off and you've got very thin carbon. Then from that, if you could then somehow turn that over, put it, use another piece of tape and somehow get it to rele release, 
you would be then transferring less of the material. And if you do that enough, you get down to one atom. Needless to say, this is not something you can do at home <laughs> because the, the scotch tape will not, not participate in going past the first layer. But if you were able to do such a thing, you get down to one layer, that layer has different properties. It's extremely strong. Not the one layer by itself, but something made out of layers of that gets to be extremely strong. And one of the, one of the ways it, it arranges itself is basically, I think of a little pipe that is a carbon nanotube, a tube, and those are then built into other things to become the material that is graphene. Graphene, it's extremely strong, extremely light, and re revolutionized something. All of your clothes could be bulletproof because if this stuff was plentiful, uh, gra carbon is very plentiful. The process to make it is still limited, but I did meet a man three years ago who had graphene um, vest, bulletproof vest that were being sold. And where or how many, I don't know. We sat next to each other at a dinner, fascinated the heck out of me about what he is uh, what he is capable of doing. And that was back then. That was actually four years ago because it was the last trip I took before the pandemic. And so since then, it's obviously gotten a lot better. And in fact, you may have seen such products on the market, but things that are that strong. If a very thin layer in a vest can stop a bullet, and of course, mo much more flexible, so great for the people that have to worry about wearing a Five, a, a bulletproof clothing at all times. And it moves beyond that. That my favorite being, if you could take all the materials that are in an automobile and reduce them down to the carbon and the other things that you have, use that carbon to make graphene and build a new car out of it. The car would be much lighter, much stronger, and would be able to move faster, safely, because of being built with modern material science. This is material science that they've gotten to making it work in the lab. It's not something you're going to go down to the car dealer and turn in your car and they'll make you a new one. But theoretically, all the pieces are there to do that. And so we have that to be explored. Once you get down to the uh, atomic size, you're able to just build anything out of just about anything. Mining really gets affected. Why would we mine for something when we're able to refine any waste materials that we have down to molecular structure and build something else out of it? Thinking about what we do with used plastics. This one I've thought about a bunch. I have no idea what the answer is. I've not read anything in particular that says that nanotechnology has fixed that, but there's got to be somebody working on it. When we're able to take our used plastic bags and, and containers and basically get them down to that material that can be reused. The biggest problem in plastics recycling is the, the inherent qualities of the material once you've shredded and cooked or whatever you do to the plastic. You can turn old plastic into new plastic, but they talk about needing so much virgin plastic in it and doing different things like that. I'm not... Ex I, can't follow the the chemistry on it, but I can tell you, recycled isn't quite as good as new, and it's and it's getting better and it's much much better. But I think we get to a point where it's practical to turn just about everything into something else without mining and without destroying more of nature. The other thing is we figure out ways to do that without pollution. So if we have an unlimited amount of electricity and an unlimited amount of materials, and we can solve any kind of pollution problems from climate warming to what, whatever. There are solutions for these things, and a big part of it is following what nanotechnology is. So if you want to know more about nanotechnology, I definitely look up the, the, the Feynman lecture, which is easy to get. It's on YouTube. Richard Feynman, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And it's in, included in some other things. There's lots of summaries. There's people who said it's the 50th anniversary of it. And here's what we think. And so there's a whole lot of writing on that. Just search for the term. There's plenty of room at the bottom. And you'll find that. And 
you know, some other people have used the title for other things, but it's mostly that. And then the Engines of Creation book, I read that back in 80, 86. I can't recommend that it's current today. Drexel wrote another book, oh, five years ago, which half of the book was his explaining where nanotechnology as a term had gone wrong. And APM, atomically precise manufacturing, was behind. And I don't know, a bit of complaining, but by the second half of the book, it is full of stuff. And I'm still using quotes from that all the time. So follow, follow that work too. And then stay tuned, come back here. We're going to be talking about how nanotechnology is going to affect your future and even get into what are some of the companies and research going on right now that are going to affect our daily life. So that's it for this episode. Come on back for some more emerging technology. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Warren Whitlock.